Oh, hello, world. Welcome to Comic Book News. Not a huge crowd on the live stream today, but you know what? This is not one of those fancy, exciting, fan-oriented, superhero, bang, pow, slam shows. This one's a little bit different, all right? This is a, a, a another one in our Comic Shop 2.0 series. You might notice up here in the corner, what's that, our little logo? That's our mascot for today. It's the Golden Handcuffs. Okay, we're going to talk about data. We're going to talk about data systems. We're going to talk about the way data and data systems can be used to empower a retailer or maybe to lock them in and chain them to one vendor or distributor or, or whatever. Who do I got to talk about that? I don't know. Who do you got? I, I couldn't think of anybody smart about comics and data. Oh, wait a minute. And then I thought, I, I know the smartest people, the best people, the most important people in comics and data. I know Milton Greep. I know John Jackson Miller, I know Brian Garside, and I know Stu Coulson. You might not know those names. You don't see them in Wizard Magazine. Is there a Wizard Magazine anymore? I don't think so. You are not. You, you might not see them there. Milton Greep you might have seen occasionally, though, in like top 100 most powerful people in comics. He makes the top 10, or he has. These guys are all in different ways major players in the world of Comics, games, pop culture, retailing, and uh, and data. How do we get? How does the rubber meet the road? How do we get products from vendors through distributors to stores and into the hands of customers? These guys are the experts on that. Okay. So besides Milton Greep, we got John Jackson Miller. You know him. He's Mister Comicron, Mister Data, also Mister Star Wars. And uh, this guy has got a lot of thoughts. If we're going to understand the future. We got to understand the past. And that's what Comicron and John Jackson Miller are all about. Nobody knows more about tracking the historical sales of comic books than this guy. That's why he's on the show. Who else? We got Brian Garside. You've met that guy before. He uh, is the creator of Manage Comics. This is a comic shop subscription service. Not a point of sale, but a piece of the puzzle in the modern comics retailer's uh, suite of tools. And speaking of a suite... We got Stu Colson. I'm super happy. I've been working on this guy for a long time, trying to get him on the show. He's from New Zealand. He runs what I think is, you know, the only, as far as I know, full scale, soup to nuts, cloud based, point of sale, subscription management, shine your shoes and do it all with a smile on his face system for running comic shops, right? You need a shop, you need a system that you're Customers can log into, do their subscriptions. You can come in, you can ring up their comics. You can do all the stuff you need to do. That's what Comic Hub does. 
We're going to bring him back in eventually for a full scale demo. Tonight's not that tonight. We're just going to bring him in, pick his brain about data. Okay. So I've said enough. Oh, wait, except for maybe one thing. Guys, let's talk the elephant in the room. Let's talk about uh, super chats. Okay. So uh, last time, you know, I may, I promised I was going to read all the super chats and I honestly thought I did. This stuff goes by in StreamYard so fast that I couldn't see them. We got a lot less people tonight, so it's probably not a problem. But honestly, if you want to get in on this conversation, you don't even have to super chat. Super chats for when there's a zillion chats going by. There's not that many. Put a good question in there. I'll put it up on the screen. But they're not even looking at the comments until the end. We're going to have a Q&A section at the end. So please save your chats for that. Now, as for those people last time who paid their hard-earned money, as they pointed out to me, to get a super chat, and they, and they expected me to stop the show in the middle and read their whatever they wanted and just totally control this show. I'm sorry I didn't do that. And I'm not going to ever do that. So save your super chat money if that's what you think is going to happen. But if you do give it, I'll use it. Um, so save that. But, if but you know, I felt bad because I looked. Could you refund super chat money? YouTube's policy is you cannot. There's no way for me to even try. But I came up with a system. So look, if you sent a super chat last time and I didn't read it, please send an email. Send your super chat refund request to betasoycuck at sjw.org. And if that email bounces to you, please print it out, roll it up and stick it where the sun don't shine because that's 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 all the good it's going to do you, right? I don't care. I don't need your super chat money. I love it. I appreciate it. You got good questions. I'll show them. The end. Wait till the end, please. But thank you. All right. Today, let's talk data. Let's bring it in. Let's start it up with uh, my primary guest. He's the guy in the thumbnail. So let's bring in the one and only Milton Greep from ICV2. Hi, Milton. Hey, Dan. How you doing? Doing great. Really great to have you on the show. Um, thanks for making the time for this. My pleasure. So I'm just going to quickly look at Man, I, I wikipedia you. <laughs> Milton, you got a master's in sociology from University of Wisconsin. You worked for Wisconsin. That's a BA. That's oh. that right? Wikipedia. That's Wikipedia. This is master's. I'll have to look at that page. Boom. I'll, <laughs> add, I'll, get, I'll get somebody on that. All right. You got a degree. You worked for Wisconsin Independent News Distributors. Right. Uh, they got purchased by Big Rapids Comic Distributors or Distribution? Big Rapids Distribution Company, BRDC. Okay. They went out of business. You went in with your buddy, John Davis, and sort of picked the bones of that and created Capital City Distribution in 1980 at the age of 26. Is that right? That's right. Okay. So what was that like? Give me, give, give, give me the, give me the overview on that. You're 26 years old. How do you want to get the idea that you want to be a distributor when you'd never, had you ever retailed before even? Well, I'd worked for two distribution companies selling comics before, so it wasn't a new business. <clears throat> And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, at Wisconsin Independent News Distributors, Wind, I'd hired John Davis, who knew probably more about the back issue market than I did. Uh, and so the two of us had also gone to Big Rapids, and we were just kind of hanging around on unemployment. And I remember John coming over to my house one day, and uh, we're in the kitchen, and he's going, hey, I think we can just, you know, we can get enough accounts probably to get off unemployment. And so that was really our goal when we started. Um, so we... Uh, Asked a few weeks, he had uh, talked to uh, Bruce Ayers from Capital City Comics in Madison, and he agreed to buy from us. And uh, we talked to about a dozen of the other customers that had been buying from us at Big Rapids, and they agreed to buy from us. And uh, so then we went about getting comics, uh, which we got initially from Russ Ernst at Glenwood uh, for everything except Marvels, and we got Marvels direct. So this was 1980. Right. I mean, if you don't mind getting into details at all, like what, what, what is that? What is an operation like that worth in 1980? Like, what are we talking about to like get started as a distributor? Like, just ballpark figure me. Uh, you mean how much money? Yeah. Over oh, sales, like uh, I don't know. That first year was maybe a million bucks, something like that. Yeah. Um, okay. Not so, huge. No, not at all. And um, in fact, it may even have been less than that. And uh, we took orders on one piece of paper. There would, on the front side, we'd list all the comics that were coming out the next in two months. Uh, Marvels took up one column. DCs took up about three quarters of the other column. And then we had some Warren magazines and Archie's down at the bottom to fill out that column. 
Then on the back, we had what we called standing draws. That's a magazine distribution term, which just means you get the same number every issue. So that's where we put yeah. magazines, which at the time would have included things like National Lampoon and Heavy Metal. Um, and uh, oh, some fanzines, early fanzines. Uh, and uh, So you so, would do those in lots, not, not individually ordered. They were ordered in lots. Is that what you mean? Uh, when you said standing, or, when you said standing, standing order. order. It means you get the same amount every month. So if yeah. you had a standing draw on Comics Journal or whatever it was, you'd get the same same number every issue. I see. And you could pick that number. And it was just like, a, just give right. me 10 every month when it comes out. Got, right. got it. And change it, but the orders didn't change that much on that kind of stuff. So Right. Sure. But so comics, somehow, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say the comics, those orders changed every, every issue. We were taking orders. They knew what the creators were. Uh, on that one piece of paper, we had the title, the price, the writer and the artist. So they had everything they needed or that we had anyway. And didn't that, did that right there tell you like what the direct market brought like a level of like knowledge of the product, a deeper, that, that could never come from like a newsstand operator or, or at least not most of them. Right. That was the whole concept that um, comic collectors wanted to buy first issues, which in the newsstand, they wouldn't even put out first issues sometimes because uh, they didn't know how it would sell. And, oh, what's this? I don't know how to, how to put it out. I'll just throw them away. And um, comic retailers and comic customers wanted those. So that was a difference. And then when an artist or writer changed, uh, they'd follow that writer or artist. And that was also a big change uh, from the newsstand business. So having that information allowed them to place better orders and allowed them to buy non-returnable, which was another big change from the newsstand. Yes. Because uh, they had to know how many they were going to sell before they bought them. Right. Well, so somehow you're able to herd those cats into a business. And it, if this is still true, by 1988, it says Capital City was the largest of the comic distributors. Is that is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. And then somewhere, so between Capital City and Diamond, that was over 70% of the direct market right there between the two distributors. Roughly, how did that break down between you and Diamond? Like, how much bigger were was Cap City than Diamond? I'm not sure, but I do know that after uh, Diamond bought Bud, then they were ahead and they were ending up, I don't know, maybe around 45%, and we were maybe 30 at that point. So before they bought Bud, maybe they were 20-ish or something like that, 20, 25. So when you say Diamond bought Bud, <clears throat> the youngsters out there, that means something totally different than it might mean to the rest of us. So when you say that, you mean he buy, bought blood, bud plant distribution. Well, he is, from, he is from California. so Grass Valley, actually, too. So what do you know? <laughs> um, okay, so Diamond, by buying bud plant, then became slightly larger than you, somewhat larger than, than Cap City's still close or... Um, like I say, I think they were more in the forties and we were still in the thirties. So they were at least Got a it. third larger by that time. Okay. But still reasonably comparable. Right. Um, but so, okay. And then somehow though, night, that was 1988. And then between 19, but from between 1988, 1996 came about the whole heroes world thing happened. We all know about that. We've talked about that on the show a lot with Steve Jeppe and other people. So we know what happened. It imploded, but when we know diamond had a choice. And they made a choice and, and they went with, uh, not Diamond, I'm sorry, DC had a choice to go exclusive with one distributor, right? They could have went with Cap City. They could have went with Diamond. And in some other universe, or actually probably like many, many alternate universes somewhere, because the probabilities were, I don't know what the difference in probability was. Like you are Steve Jeppy, or you were in the place, could have been the, the, the king of comics, if you will, and the sole controller for the last 20 years of the comic industry. You ever think about that and, and think about why it didn't or what if or why? Uh, well, I mean, to some extent, everybody's always thinking about their last deal, but I've had a lot of deals since then. So uh, of course. I, spend a lot of it. Um, I guess uh, when I think about it, it's when I see things going in a different direction than I would have chosen. And um you know, I think Steve's been a good steward of the business. I think his uh, heart is definitely in the right place. He loves comics. He loves the business. He loves comic retailers. Um, but there are times when I would do something different. And right now is one of those times. Okay, great. Well, well, really what prompted me to, to, to bring you in, Milton, was an article you wrote on ICV2. And that's one of those things that you did. But before we, before we get there, I'm sorry, I'm jumping out of order. So Cap Cities uh, purchased. By, by Jeppy and, 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 and Diamond, got absorbed. Now that was the market. You went into consulting. 
And then you were part of Next Planet Over, right? An early right. online comic and games re, uh, pop retail, culture retailer, whatever you want to call them. A little bit controversial. Why, you want to like just give us a like a quick topic about that and why that might have been um, a sore th thing to some retailers and other people? Um, well, it was uh, originally founded by two uh, Wharton MBAs. Um, and that was during the dot-com boom, uh, sort of the first explosion of online businesses. So uh, money was relatively easy to raise. Uh, I helped them finish their first angel round and their first venture round and um, served as an outside chairman and advisor. And uh, um, the business model was uh, an e-commerce store. Uh, we also had content and community, uh, but we actually got uh, made an arrangement with Diamond to ship orders to consumers on our behalf. And uh, that was kind of based on the Amazon model, which at the time was selling books and having Ingram distribution uh, ship them to consumers on their behalf. So some similarities there. Okay. Um, so there was a little bit of, uh, of, of bitterness at some retailers saying maybe Diamond was going to ship directly in competition to their clients. Maybe there was a conflict of interest. Um Either way, it didn't really last too long. What, what, what went wrong with ne Next Planner Over, if you could sum it up? Well, the timing was, uh, so we started in business um, summer of 99. Uh, we were running off our first venture round. Time to raise the second round, early 2000. Stock market for dot-coms crashed. That meant exit path changed. So VC money dried up. Uh, so we had to sell. So we okay. sold the bones to a company called eHobbies. Covered all the debt, but the equity got washed. Okay. And since then, you went and founded ICV2 uh, in 2001. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an online uh, newsletter community for hobbies, comics, and games retailers. You've put out an annual white paper about the sales of comics. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a paid like pro subscription plan, which I just signed up for a, for a year's subscription. You retailers out there and retail types should sign up for one too pretty good deal for the amount of info what kind of tell tell, tell the people what do they get out of a hundred dollar a year subscription to icv2 well uh it allows us to expand our content in ways we couldn't do without the pro subscription so um part of it is data driven uh we built a database that goes back about 20 years of uh all of the diamond numbers uh which we reverse engineer from their indexes and uh so there's 20 years of comics data available. You can search by title. You can look at a graph of sales over time. You can look at titles, uh, different titles based on uh, or tied to the same character. And uh, so that's a useful tool. Uh, it also has all our magazine content, which is where we do a lot of our feature writing and our in-depth analysis. Uh, so that's available there, uh, which is not always available online. Um, we have a deal with NPD uh, to publish actual book scan numbers for graphic novels every month, the bestsellers. Uh, so on the public site, we publish a ranking, but you can know how many copies of um, Killing Joke, which is still selling, sold in December of uh, 2019 using that. And then we create content specifically for uh, the pro site. Um, some things we do are channel checks where we'll go around and look at the chains. You know, what do the displays look like in Barnes & Noble? What do the displays look like at Walmart? Yeah. What do they look like at Target? Um, and a lot of people find that useful. And then I'll do writing specifically for the, um, for the uh, pro site. Uh, over the last few months during the COVID crisis, I've been putting that kind of stuff online just as sort of a service to help people maybe get a better understanding of what this crisis is about and how to respond to it. At some point in the next month or two, we'll start taking that stuff back, back behind the paywall. Right. Well, you wrote a, a really interesting article about, you know, where we go and the future of, uh, of ordering stuff. Right. I mean, we've talked on this show about previews before and how you were one of the creators of an early, the early precursors to previews and those one sheet catalogs you mentioned. And that expanded into in internal con correspondence, I guess, was part that part commentary or, or, or um uh, business uh, analysis. Um, uh, yeah, please. Well, that was separate, actually. Uh, the big thing I was talking about in, in those two columns uh, was Advanced Comics, which was the first uh, consumer catalog created by a distributor so that retailers could right. use it to take orders. 
and then place their orders to a distributor. So that started in 1988. Um, Diamond ended up doing a similar publication uh, sometime later. Uh, Steve Bond from Bud Plant, after that acquisition, helped them helped them put it together. And um, but all the key elements that are still there in previews were there. The, the order cycle was the same. Um, the uh, idea that uh, consumers would order like a week before the orders were due to the distributor and then the distributor would add up their orders and pass them on to the, to the publishers. Uh, all of those elements were there. Uh, the content side, we did include some content, but internal correspondence was actually a separate uh, magazine which had, had data about titles, how titles were selling uh, relative to each other. That's another thing that Diamond uh, adopted, the indexes that show how, for example, you know, Batman sells relative to Superman. And um, uh, that actually became ICV2, which stands for Internal Correspondence Version 2. Right. So as if that's not enough, you're also on the board, you were or are on the board of Directors of Comicsology. Uh, I was, yes. Yeah, um, five years until we sold out to Amazon. Right. Uh, on the board of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. Uh, right, about 15 and years. Yeah, and also on like I guess the steering committee maybe for Free Comic Book Day or whatever that's called. You're yeah, you're involved. They had, with they had one of those early on when Free Comic Book Day was new. They sort of brought a bunch of uh, people from the industry together to talk about it every year. And once they got it running smoothly, they uh, Diamond uh, just uh, carried on on their own. But during the development of the initial model, um, I was on that initial committee. Okay, folks. So those of you out there who said Milton, who? All right, this guy's got bona fides. All right, we just we just listed him, and he what he when it comes to data and publishing stuff about comics, it, there's only one source. There's really only one place that does serious non fan oriented commentary on the comics industry. It's ICB too. Oh, and comic book news too. Um, but wait, you've got help on the data collection angle. You got a partner in crime who's a partner, uh, who's, a, who's a, a contributor rather to this show. Um, he's been on before. I'm gonna bring him in right now. Uh, John Jackson Miller, welcome back to Comic Book News. How's it going? Going great. Um, I'm gonna, before I bring the last, the other two guests in, I just wanted to real quick touch on, John, you work, you do great work at Comicron, cataloging yeah. the past and the history of sales and comics. Um, so we wanted to bring you in because we're talking about the future. So we want to get a little context on the past and also how do we make sure to preserve the data that's happening every day and flowing by us every month and every week and every day and, and preserve that into the future so that we have good sales to, um, you know, yeah. make the decision. Um, well, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that, please, if you, if you could. Well, I'm I'm really happy that uh, Milton is on here. Milton is is I would say the patron saint of uh, data uh, for historians that are, are collecting things. Uh, he's right. Just about everything that Diamond has been doing in terms of reporting over the years, uh, Capital did first, and uh, you know it, it was. Uh, you know, the when when Diamond did in its uh, its Diamond Dialogue magazine its sales charts with order index numbers that is you know, directly uh, based on something that uh, that Capital did first and had been doing for uh, over five years by that point uh, and uh, just used a different title to uh, to key the uh, to key the comics to uh, but uh, you know, it was a lot more than that as well uh, a lot of what we know about comics in the eighties and nineties comes from uh, the robust, uh, you know, publishing that Capital did uh, in its magazines, uh, in its uh, in its publications, and uh, I have an entire wall just of the books here and of the magazines here. And Milton has been good enough to help me, uh, uh, you know, fill in some of the blanks in that collection. And then also, uh, you know, when when Capital, uh, you know, shuttered in '96. Uh, uh, was able to help me get a lot of the internal data that uh, we then later on put into the uh, standard catalog standard catalog of comic books uh and uh, and so you know it, it's one of those things where uh you know we know a different amount about what comics sold every month of the last 85 years sometimes we know a whole lot sometimes we know very little uh and uh you know capital uh and it's 
data that it just publishes a matter of course and and not just for you know academic interest or anything like that it, it, the numbers were out there for a reason the order index numbers were there for a reason they were there to help sell more comics they were there to help retailers sell more comics so that if you were a retailer and you saw this teenage mutant ninja turtles thing come along and uh, i've never heard of this before but you would see it on the chart and you would see that you know for every hundred copies of x-men you know, 10 of the 10 copies of Turtles or maybe not Turtle, but something else that would have made the bottom of the chart uh, are, are there. Uh, you had retailers then adjusting their orders uh, to try to chase that. Uh, and uh, that is why, you know, even today, I've, I've said that those charts uh, that Diamond publishes, uh, they are not for entertainment purposes. They are not, uh, they are not for, you know, the horse race. Uh, they're there in order to serve the retailers that are Diamond's customers. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it all figures into the whole, you know, the whole question of data and, you know, data in for comics retailing, you know, goes back to cycle sheets, uh, just people recording on paper what they sold. Uh, and there were, there were still retailers that weren't using cycle sheets up through the mid 90s. Uh, but we start getting uh, point of sale systems coming along uh, I, I, Milton will correct me if I'm wrong. I think I think Comtrack uh, was probably the first one. That was Mel Thompson's suite uh, that he did. Uh, but I, I mean, there were there were there's a lot of different ways that retailers can use numbers. And then for us on the on the uh, you know collector side, we want the numbers too. Uh, we just want them for different reasons. We want them uh, some to argue about them, uh, but uh, a lot more people. I think the more lasting importance of this is to you know suggest what the original supply of things was what the sure. scarcity is of things uh and whether x-men number one volume two number one is really rare when there's 8.1 million copies of it right well bro you brought up contract and that's great segue because now we're going to bring in some we're going to start talking point of sale we're going to start talking systems for a minute contract by the great Melchior Thompson, right? He was one of the first that I know of anyway, consultants to the direct market. He would help stores. He put together contract, one of the first DOS-based point of sale inventory ordering system that actually had a lot of great, a lot of things that I copied in my own hijink system. Now you'll notice the little red circle and here, I, I use this as a little code. When I put up the names of some of these point of sale vendors, I'm going to put a little commentary there. You can see the dinosaur logo for contract. It's legacy. I'm not going to recommend it as a system that a new store could go for. It doesn't mean it wasn't the best of or only or and isn't still great in its own way. I just wouldn't recommend it for a new store. Okay. Um, another one I would not recommend is the Hijinx Namor system. This is a system that I myself wrote and released i wrote it in pearl and uh, it did a lot of things for its time it was the first web-based subscription management and book club tracking and all around more of a customer relationship manager than it was a point of sale so to speak um i wouldn't recommend it either you could try to comb through that code there's a, some great retailers out there like ed greenberg in 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 uh, Southern California, Collector's Paradise. He uses it in all three of his stores. He's a big fan. He's continued the legacy. He took my code and expanded on it. And 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 I love him for that. Um, another system that I moved to before I left my store, I didn't want to leave a proprietary system with no support in the hands of the guy I sold my store to. So I got him onto Moby, the only Mac-based direct market specific point of sale program that I knew that was specifically for Max. It was based on FileMaker Pro or FileMaker. Uh, it was done by another retailer, really sharp, savvy retailer named Ben Trujillo out of St. Louis, Star Clipper Comics, Eisner Award winning store. I thought it was an okay system. I'm not a fan of FileMaker. I didn't like the interface. There were some weird quirks to it. It's so hyper diamond specific. Um, but a lot of stores like it. If you like a Mac, it was the only game in town. But the reason I put the X or the no, they've dropped all support for it. So there is no official support available for Moby. So I'm not going to recommend that. Okay. Um, the other game in town, I'm sorry. And to live up to the golden handcuffs named Comic Suite. I'm sorry. I'm just going to go through these quickly because now I'm going to get to the next. I'm going to get to a couple other systems in our, our last two guests. Comic Suite is built, was built on top of Microsoft RMS. 
uh, and it, it was a, a Microsoft only program. Ironically, even though it was built by a distributor, it was probably the most flexible because it was built on RMS, which was built for many different industries, but it's also very complicated and tough to customize yourself. So Diamond built a set of customizations on top of that. Honestly, I'm not sure. I, I have heard varying things about how well they support that. Most things not that great as far as customer support. And when I reached out to Diamond, I have I kind of got uh, crickets about like, did they want to show off this stuff or talk about it at all? In the midst of COVID, I understand, whatever. They've also got a, a, an online pull box based system. And I know the guy at Diamond, Chris Powell, who runs this stuff is super sharp and savvy and cares about retailers. So I know they're they're doing things, but now with the chaos in the distribution chain, they must be scrambling to get caught up. Milton, you got any insights or thoughts about that at all before I bring in the next two guys about like with this, with this kind of a shift, do you think, we, okay, if you were, if you ran diamond, would you be looking to open up your point of sale and be more open and make it multi distributor? Or would you be looking more to clamp down and tighten those golden handcuffs? Well, I think that uh, horse is out of the barn. Uh, the multiple uh, sources of supply has already happened and the turn back the clock. So I think any system has to, has to support uh, multiple suppliers and specifically as it relates to comic suite, I think uh, uh, Microsoft stopped supporting RMS some years ago. So I don't think there's been any continuing development on the underlying software. So I don't know how long that uh, Diamond can continue to base their POS system on this unsupported system from uh, Microsoft. <clears throat> All right. It's a legacy system. A lot of stores are tied to it, though, and they're going to use it for a long time. But if they were taking my advice back in 2000, they would be thinking about moving to the cloud and to, well, we didn't call it the cloud back then. We just called it a web-based or a server-based system or a client server, whatever you want to call it. But now we got the web. Okay. And so I had a vision back then for a cloud-based point of sale, soup to nuts, do every single thing. And I got this close. I got pretty close. I had an online bookstore. I had an online subscription management and I had a comic management system and they were all tied together on one server somewhere, but I couldn't productize it. I wasn't smart enough or had enough bandwidth or, or capitalization to do that. But along came a guy named Stu, all right, out of New Zealand. And Stu had a store. I think this is the story. I'm going to ask him. And he decided there's a better way. He he was in tune with that vision. Even if we never met or even if he never heard of hijinks, he had the same vision, but he made it real. He put the he put the resources together to build out a really awesome system that I personally know many retailers use and love. So I want to welcome to the show for the first time, Stu Colson from Comic Hub. Welcome, Stu. Hello, Dan. Thank you. Hey guys. John, how are we doing, Milton? Hey, and can, you hear, can you hear me clearly? Can you hear me clearly? We sure can very clearly. Yep, cool. fact, a little, okay. little hot, even. Maybe. All right, all right. Okay. Um, I also just want to bring in right now Brian Garside. He's been on the show before, and we'll just just throw the conversation open, guys. Brian Garside is the owner and creator of Manage Comics, a system that's not really a, a direct competitor to Stu. Really, it's it's uh, it's it's a, it's almost a subset of what Stu does. And I wanted these guys on the show because it highlights two different approaches okay this is not just in comics retail but everywhere there's talk about systems being loosely coupled versus all in one systems right we have a system that can do everything and you got to buy all into that or should we a la carte choose a different uh, online store and a different point of sale system and a different subscription management system and somehow tie all that stuff together so that's what uh that's the difference between what you guys do I want to just really quick uh, 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 get get your take on that, Stu. Do you feel that's a fair comparison or a fair setup of yes. sort of the difference? Definitely, definitely. We have people who contact us who do want to pick and choose, but because our product is completely integrated, it's not something we can do. So Brian's solution, what do you got? What's that tag on my name there, man? <laughs> Comic Suite RMS and Pool Box? Is that oh, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> sorry, um, buddy. Yeah, no, I mean, different operations want to run in different ways. And yeah, we, I mean, we, we can convert a previous point of sale system. We convert Comic Suite to our data. So that helps some people. But um, others who don't have those tools in place already, I think a stepping stone system um, makes a lot more sense for them. 
So break down for yeah. me if you could really quickly. What are the like the the feature set? If you said like the top, you know, with the core features that it lets you do, how would you describe that? Subscription right. manager. Yeah, I mean, customers have con full control over their own ordering, but um, because it's integrated into the point of sale and also links to website tools as well, I think at the moment, because of COVID, the biggest feature that our tools have is as soon as you finish processing your shipment, customers can log into their account and just pay for what's aside without having to come into the store. And that, for our existing client base, has been probably the most beneficial tool right now. Um, keeping that ca keeping that cash flow moving. I mean, we've just finished our shipment, and I've already just about turned over enough to cover the invoice without, you know, without even closing for the day. It's so amazing. Like anybody who was already set up with Comic Cub, no, obviously not thinking about COVID or anything like this. Nobody was, but man, for them to be able to just keep going and like have not have a breakdown, and frankly, just the prepayment of subscriptions alone, I feel is like the biggest problem yeah. facing most direct market stores yeah. and yeah we we've completely changed our model i mean as a store as well um we're, we're now 10 days once products arrived if you haven't paid for it within 10 days it's it's on the shelf um and we really haven't had to do that for anyone everyone understands you know cash flow is king at the moment so everyone is just logging in and paying for it but amazon don't let you order books and let them sit in their warehouse and pay for them next month when you the payments arrive you know no other no other industry allows that um so yeah that's that's probably the biggest part at the moment that's helping everyone i mean there's obviously a ton of other things there's all the marketing and such but that's the one that in this COVID environment is is really helping everyone and we've had one retailer um since march has done i think close to forty thousand online um that's using awesome. our tools you know to, for a total of 300 bucks in fees which is you know good for him yeah. That is so great. So, so you, but you nailed it when you said, so I, I, when I was looking at this problem and I, and I started looking at it again, I got more chops writing software. I'm like, I can write software now, but I, it's a beast to take on that entire thing that you did. The yeah. full integrated suite. It is so much that yeah. I didn't think I could do it, you know? And I thought slice off, if I were to slice off one piece that I felt was the most important, the most beneficial to the direct market, it would have been subscription management and prepayment. Um, that's what Brian Garside at Manage Comics does. So Brian, just real quick, hit us to the, the Manage Comics approach and, uh, you know, like, like that's great. I can order stuff, but like some retailers would want the whole suite, right? They'd want to check it in, get subscriptions, ring it up and everything. How does your system differ from that? So we, we mostly focus on the subscription part of it. So the, the month to month, you know, recurring part of it. Um, and then there's an entire, so it was built originally uh, to solve an online stores problem. And so there's, um, there's a billing system and all that stuff. So uh, as soon as customers can actually pre-authorize credit cards. So as soon as um, their stuff is ready to go, uh, their credit card gets charged and boom, it can go off. So if, um, they can ship it out or during COVID it was perfect. Like so many stores had, had changed over to that system and uh, they were doing curbside or whatever. Yeah. So it's um, my idea was always there's smarter people who build point of sale systems like square was doing one. Uh, Shopify has a really good one. Now light speed was out there. I didn't want to touch that part. I would rather, <laughs> coming and, and support the part that those point of sale systems just can't simply can't because they don't get the comics market. And that's the big thing is our market is so unique. When you explain this market to anyone else, they're like, what? That doesn't even make sense. Right? Like, so yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting market. Believe me, I've tried and I've talked to many people like Ed, when he tried to bring people in to edit my software. Oh yeah. Not enough that it was written in Perl, which is like a not well used language, but then you got to find someone who does that and understands comics and the ordering cycles and everything else. It's so talking, talking to my developers, 95% of the explanation is not the code, it's why you have to do it this specific, really weird yeah. way. Okay. All right. So that's what we're all here to really talk about. So Milton Greek, it all comes back to you now. I would like you to, if you could give us a, the gist of, of your articles. You really, you wrote two, one about the history of previews. You sort of gave us a little tidbit of that already. 
So maybe tell us what what are your thoughts about what the future needs for ordering systems? Like what are we what are we lacking now? And what do we need in a nutshell? Well, the impetus for thinking about this now is really COVID. And uh, when Diamond shut down for a couple of months, uh, every uh, supply chain was disrupted. You know, there was product on the way from the printers. There was product that wasn't able to be printed because some printers were not operating um, out there in the rest of the world, there were some publishers who were continuing to ship. Um, so uh, flexibility became even more important than it had been in the past. And previews is just uh, not a tool that's uh, appropriate for the current environment. It hasn't been for probably a decade. And the reason is it was built for periodicals that have repetitive sales. And even in periodical comics, that's a pretty small percentage of the total. I mean, how many comics run the same series for over a year? You know, it's got to be well under a half, maybe under a quarter of comic titles that actually run on an, as an ongoing series. So um, even for periodicals, um, this whole idea of a monthly catalog wasn't working that well. And then um, there's been all these uh, other changes. For example, the use of Asian suppliers for printing. So that means that some things have longer than longer supply chains than the old uh, periodical systems. So a publisher might send their graphic novels to be printed in Asia. So all of a sudden, those have to be ordered further in advance. So to me, the whole idea of a monthly catalog that listed all the product that was going to come out in two months uh, just hasn't worked for a while. And now that all the supply chains are disrupted, it got even more um, uh, unwieldy and unusable. Uh, so I was kind of hoping that when Diamond uh, looked around and looked at COVID, they just start running with final order cutoff and just keep going and never start previews up. But they are uh, going back to previews and they're going to try to make that work. Uh, so the system that I think should be used is obviously all based on online. I think the whole idea of a print catalog is something that you'd have to explain to somebody under 20. Uh, they might have seen their, their parents get one in the mailbox, but they don't really know what it's for or how it's used. Um, so um, I think the key is it has to be done online. I think using technology, the key for retailers, and one of the most important benefits is tightening up the ordering cycle. So, you know, taking uh, consumer orders as long as they possibly can, and then ordering as close to the release date as they possibly can. So their orders are as close as possible to the actual demand. So they don't have unsold inventory or miss the opportunity to sell uh, new products. Um, so uh, to make that work, I think uh, retailers have to be able to start taking orders as soon as the product information is available. Amazon has books on their site that are going to come out in nine to 12 months. And comic retailers lose sales every single day that that product is up on Amazon and they have taken orders for You're it. You're right. I, they've lost them for me. My question, though, is... That seems a little bit at odds, though, your two statements, because like if you're saying then that a, a publisher should what publish what their catalog is going to be for the entire year and then just allow retailers to do that. Or are you saying they should release a new catalog every week, essentially, like everybody? It should be weekly, a weekly cadence to ordering rather than monthly. What, what are you talking about cadence wise? And then I want to throw it to the panel just about that specifically about ordering cadence monthly, weekly, like what? Well, it has to be flexible enough to handle any order, ordering cadence. I mean, the reason it's up on Amazon is that the book channel works on a whole different schedule. I mean, they're ordering uh, where we are. We're in June. So they've uh, ordered a lot of their Christmas titles already, might already be thinking about next spring. Uh, and at the same time, comic retailers maybe don't even know about those titles yet because they haven't been in previews yet, and their customers are finding them on Amazon. So the book channel uses different ordering cycle. Uh, periodicals, this whole idea of ordering two months in advance has sort of been broken down by final order cutoff, which allows retailers to order three weeks in advance. So why are they still ordering some comics two months in advance and some three weeks in advance? And then there's things like Funko Pops, which have longer uh, ordering cycles because they're manufactured in China. Or sometimes they'll announce one and it's coming out three weeks later and you got to be able to jump on it. So the ordering cycle should be Here's the order. Here's the orders that are due this week in order to be guaranteed your quantity. And that might right. be periodicals that are coming out in three weeks. It might be graphic novels that are coming out in two months. It might be a Funko Pop that's coming out in two weeks or in two months. Uh, uh, so, in other words, the ordering date is not based on the 
ship date, but more on like the cut, the last possible moment to get as many orders as possible before it's put into production to be right. more efficient. In the supply chain. You can get, get those orders for your customers. Okay. Hey, um, hey, uh, Hey John, what are your thoughts on, on that? On 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 cadence? What would that does that have any effect on like the historical or any of the month to month or week to week tracking, or would it basically break down kind of the same? Uh, well, let me let me roll back just a second when we were talking about previews and what yeah. good it serves. One of the things that has to be taken into account is that previews is a profit center uh, on its own. Uh, they sell advertising. Uh, it was in part all of the uh, publisher ads going to previews after, uh, you know, after uh, uh, you know Diamond absorbed uh, all the exclusives uh, that uh, got comics retailer magazine turned into comics and games retailer uh, because all of the comics advertising was dollars were going towards previews. Uh, and yes, a lot of those ads are free because they uh, you know, they go into the exclusive publishers and they're they're part of uh, part of those bargains, part of those deals. But that's got to be something that Diamond would be looking at in any change that they would want to do. Is if this thing goes online or somewhere else, they've got to be able to monetize those yes. eyeballs somehow, uh, so you know, that's, selling that's that audience. Yeah, I wonder and if so, ever thought so of that, that, online. Say, say that again, Milton. Uh, I wonder if advertise. I, and also, I guess I dispute the idea that it's a profit center. I don't know that we know that. I think if you analyze all the costs, including the cost of having the wrong inventory at retailers, either too much or too little because they had to place orders too far in advance, that pretty soon you'd find out that it's not necessarily a profit, profit center. It is revenue, but I don't know if they actually make money on it. Hmm. I, I don't know whether it is now. Uh, I do know that we had a staff at Krause for at least all the way to 2005 that was going through every catalog, including including Advanced Comics for a while, and flagging which ones were likely uh, paid ads and which ones were likely not. And they were doing the math on it based on the uh, based based oh. on the rate cards. But then, no, whether it is now, uh, I, what we're talking about a 600 page magazine, I don't know. Let's call let's call it like it is though. Let's call it what you're saying exactly. Okay. So when you look in previews and they say the diamond gem, right? And they say like this is like editorial content saying this is great stuff, man. We looked at this. This is really awesome. We should buy this. That's paid for by the publisher, right? Uh no, I don't think so. I mean, it's uh I would say to be fair, it it's probable that margin is one of the things they're looking at when they're choosing which titles to promote, but they don't want to promote stuff that doesn't sell. So um, they're also looking at, you know, what they can enhance sales on because if people order more, they'll sell more. Okay. Stu, uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to unmute Stu. Cause I've, there was a little bit of noise Stu. So I'm, I've been muting you while, when you're not talking, I, I want to know your feelings on previews in general, the monthly cadence, and, and if it were to become weekly, would that throw um, your world? Chaos. I mean, as a, as a store, um, we we don't really use previews. I think we we've got about six or seven hundred active customers ordering. We do that with two copies. Uh, it's not a tool that we've used for some time. But I think product should be advertised when it's ready. I, I don't like rushed work. I don't like the fact that um, you know the comic industry a little bit is based around the fastest work an artist can turn out and not his best work. And I don't think that helps us and I don't think it helps our long term. And I think any change to how we do that um, needs to be embraced. Um, wow. the, the comic needs to publish. We need to be selling the, the best possible creations that writers and artists can come up with, not the fastest. I think that's. I'm a I'm a fan of getting paid as soon as I get anything written. I gotta say, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> competing interest though. There's competing interest, like you say. I think yeah, do, and I think that actually raises why things like crowdfunding, where somebody people are willing to pay way in advance yeah. for creator or no quantity that they like, it's 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 a thing. Brian, I'm, Stu, I'm gonna mute you again. There's a little bit of extra noise there. Um, Brian Garside. So, if we want to go, if everything changed and we needed to go to a weekly order and cadence, which I think is reasonable. Jim Hanley, by the way, the legendary retailer, has been preaching the idea of weekly previews 
for years before he retired. So how would that impact him? Do you think that's a good idea? Would that be, would that, would most of your retailers say, oh man, now I got to work more and I don't like that? I don't know, because because we've already got the concept of the FOC, and that's essentially every week they're doing their orders again. Um, yes. And and DC's almost experimenting with that right now, right? Like, they, they do have stuff out, but everybody's doing UCS and Lunar orders weekly, and we don't know whether at the end of this month, next week is the week that previews normally comes out. Will DC be doing... A monthly one or will they do week by week uh, as of july we don't well, know when you, when you say retailers are already doing final order cutoff i know that's going to vary wildly wildly sure. from store to store some stores i've talked to have never even heard of it i have talked to store owners who do not know what i'm talking about when i mention a final order <laughs> yeah so Stu, I want to go back to Stu again because I see Stu laughing a little bit. I don't know. Maybe he was laughing about what he was saying. Do you think um, it's going to be more work for retailers? Are they going to, or would there be pushback if suddenly Diamond or anybody, whatever, we said now we're doing weekly ordering from now on as a new order form every week? I, I think weekly makes sense, but the, the items need to be available well before a week. I mean, you can't, you can't have the first time the customers are going to see it be Thursday for an order you've got to place on Monday. So regard, so however DC, uh, sorry, however UCS or Luna do this, they have to have these catalog that we have to, um, you know, Brian will be in the same position as me. We, we have to have that information out a, a good five, six weeks before oh, yeah. for our customers uh, as retailers to consume that information. Um, if we start trying to drop it and you've got three days to order it, um, there's there's a lot of casual customers who will just drop off the wagon. I mean, the, the people who are into your store every Wednesday, they're not a problem, but there's a lot more people and um, they, that would just be a nightmare managing them. But I don't, I don't get the point of an initial order for items that are on FOC. It, that to me is, I mean, the only reason, the only way, the only thing our Comic Cub users do it is we place the exact orders on initial and then with the marketing tools we've got, we can then see if it's adjusted by the time FOC rolls around. So has there been a bump from our efforts or have people dropped off since I placed the order and, and track it that way? That's about the only useful metric you get out of having them as an initial and an FOC item. Um, it is it is work for nothing beyond that. Hmm. I, 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 what I see it as is because it's, it's very interesting. Milton, the the what Stu said is super on point. I didn't really think about that, right? Like how long is the window? So I think Milton, what you're saying is that it should be as soon as they know about it, order yeah. it, like publish what the deadline is, and then you can order it all the way up until the deadline. But I'm right. having a hard time understanding how a retailer, like what is the, the nuts and bolts of how that works and how, what I would be sitting down and even who am I doing this? With? Like, who who would be the provider of this? To me, Brian seems well positioned in what he does, and Stu also. Like, if Brian were to become a multi kind of catalog aggregator, if you will, and provide some sort of interface that allowed ordering all the way up until final order cutoff. Um, Brian, what are your what, what what are your thoughts on that? Have you considered that at all? Have you thought about bringing in? For instance, the book trade distributors uh, being able to do Penguin and Random House and whatever and add those to pre-orders. Well, we're, we're going to have to start doing that. So in Canada, which is where I'm from, um, Penguin Ram Random House is now the main DC bookseller up here. Um, and a lot of the stores are going to start using them because their shipping is way, way cheaper. They invoice in Canadian dollars, which I don't know if you've seen the American versus Canadian dollar right now, but... There's no way I'm going to America anytime soon. Um, and on top of that, uh, the they aggregate shipping and there's local hubs everywhere in Canada, whereas like the rest of them just aren't like that. So yeah, uh, for sure, we have to figure that out, which kind of goes back to the whole series code thing, which up until now, Diamond has always kind of maintained the series code concept, but with publishers like Alterna who've left Diamond, um, you got source point with whatever they're doing with their their thing. This is going to become a bigger problem, and we can't rely on Diamond to provide necessary data like like series code. 
Right. Well, Stu's, or... Stu's smiling like a <laughs> canary. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, pitched, we pitched the idea of Comic Hub the Diamond about six, seven years ago, um, and they're going to get back to us in a couple of weeks, apparently. <laughs> um, <laughs> still waiting. But when, they, when, when after a month they chose not to, we looked at their data and said, we can't rely on anything. So we're not affected by the series codes and we're not affected by Luna and UCS. So all of our clients' orders and customer orders just naturally switch to the new provider with no work required by anybody. And the same thing will happen with um, series codes from other publishers. We don't, we map theirs into our system. Yeah, we turn yeah. their little six digit crazy thing into a 36 character GUID that doesn't affect us at all. And we already are using other suppliers. So Comic Hub is not diamond centric. We have um, we have New Zealand Mint products in there. We're um, going to be bringing in um, the, any other publishers. And maybe that's a conversation for next time, Dan, but we're expanding the entire ordering platform to any publisher that wants to put their in-stock products in there. They can do that as well in the next couple of weeks. So oh, we've been yeah. working flat out on having our stores sort of second wave ready um and then as a shop you know we're getting by on selling what we've got so our our what we're going to be pushing out there to publishers is let's help you sell what you've got let's stop printing for a little bit longer and let's just sell what's in our warehouses and stuff so we're expanding the customer tools to allow any publisher to go and put everything that they want in there and, and drop ship it to stores or use diamond yeah. continue to use diamond doesn't matter again our codes don't care what the suppliers are it's you've ordered this comic who where does it come from and that's who will fulfill it so yeah, I'm That's pretty. I'm, I'm not saying I'm happy with what's gone down. There's been a bit of work for us to sort it out, but we are future proofed for distrib yeah. different distributors yeah. providing different products. It doesn't affect us at all. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. you take the groundwork for that, and that is awesome, yeah. dude. That was a lot of forethought, like, yeah. the, and you were ready for this thing, and and that you're reaching out to these other publishers, and we're thinking about other distributors too. Is smart. And speaking of reaching out, hey. Do you want to be a guest or have sure. your comic book shoot on comic book news? Email sure. comic book news at danshaheen.com and I'll bring you on the show. Send me some comics. I'll show them. You got software you want to show for comic book stores that you want to have featured on the show? Bring it on, buddy. I'll show it. I'll feature it. We'll talk about the pros and cons and tell the truth. All right. Uh, back to the show. So, um, Brian Garside. Tell me, um, any plans for point of sale integration with your products? Are there any out of the box? If I, if somebody wanted to buy your product, what, what do you recommend to them for everything else besides subscriptions? I don't know what the go-to point of sale would the, be. The main thing would be, um, would be Shopify. We've got a, we've got a partnership right now with a company called Binder POS, which is also in New Zealand. Um, and they focus mostly on the game trade. So they do Magic the Gathering singles and, and all that stuff. Um, and so we are kind of, all their store front ends are Shopify, which I don't know if you've seen a Shopify website, but they've come a my, million miles. They're yeah. so nice. Um, they've got great searchability and all that stuff. SEO is through the roof, which is kind of one of my fortes. Um, and so- That's that's search engine optimization, right? That's the like that, customer right. people who search and find your website. Yeah, yeah. So what's really nice is that Shopify becomes the thing that all the products go into, and then the POS communicates with that. So we taught we upload the products to Shopify from Managed Comics, and then uh, now the products are available on a POS that way. Ah, so you're leveraging the Shopify API, right? The That's application. Right, yeah programmer yeah. interface yeah so all that stuff like for for me I, I, pos pos is such a a ux problem that i didn't ever want to touch it i'm an awesome web guy i am yeah. not a, a ux guy who can do this stuff so yeah. to me just take that right out of the equation i don't i don't want to handle it yeah no i i i can understand that um Stu, what are your thoughts on that like g give me the breakdown of like if we if we're talking about point of sale program, and and somebody wants to sell, if they want to use Comic Hub and they and comics they want to sell something besides comics, would you recommend Comic Hub to them, 
Would you say it's a general purpose point of sale to any degree, or is it really, really focused on direct marketing? Um, if you look at some of our stores now, they've got cafes attached to them, and the point of sale system has a full cafe module in it as well. Um, you know, with a lot of the stock we're bringing out of um, from Diamond, if you've got T-shirts in different sizes and all that, it handles all of that. So it's definitely specific to comics and it has a lot more parts in there. Um, but the marketing tools would work for any um, supplier. The, the you know, the click, selecting previous purchases and stuff, what people have got and letting them know about new items. All of that works for any system. But we're, we're comics focused. That's definitely our gig. That's, yeah, that's no, it makes Position ourselves there, but anyone could could use it. But I, I, I mean, there's a lot of data in there that is comic related. Um, I don't know if we'd really look beyond the comic comic and game industry, um, just for yeah lack of knowledge of that particular industry and what extras we'd have to build for it. So, it, I've done comic. I've had my shop now for 25 years. I know what I need in there as a point of sale system, and that's what we keep adding and. We call it the hive mind. You know, we've got 120 stores now. We've got our team of developers in India. So there's just continual upgrades. But all those requests are, are comic or game related. There's no one saying, hey, can we improve the T-shirt line? Yeah. Okay. Well, so Milton Greep, if you were getting back into the distribution business, don't you think you'd be talking to Steve Colson and trying to work a deal to get a system like that for your customers to try and provide some value? I think the first thing is I'd have to acknowledge that there's competition for everything I sell, almost everything I sell. I mean, the front of the book in Diamond is exclusive. The rest of the stuff is not. Uh, so anything that a retailer is using has to be able to accommodate multiple suppliers. And that. Um, so, yeah, I think Comic Cup would be a really good ally. And uh, then I try to make, um, you know, my system maybe work better with Comic Hub than other people are because I'm more familiar with the comics business or in yes. cases because they're more familiar with the comics business. Um, but work with the new tool. You know, I think uh, Diamonds had kind of a build it themselves kind of attitude. The comic suite was an example. It took, it was a good thing at the end, but it took a long time to develop and um, um, wasn't around for several years when retailers really needed a POS system. So, yes. um, forming an alliance and uh, working with somebody that's um, focused on that part of the business might be a good way to go. Yeah, being a good or even a great distributor doesn't mean you'll be a halfway, even a halfway decent software developer, right? Those those skills, that's a whole separate set of skills. And, and also, frankly, the whole thing, right? The theme of this show, the golden handcuffs, right? People should be afraid. I'm just going to say it. They should be afraid of a point of sale owned by a distributor. I think I would not be afraid of something like Comic Hub because Stu has an interest in working with multiple vendors and has an interest in not locking you in to one vendor. And I'm not saying that's the reasoning behind Comic Hub or what they were planning. I, I think Diamond legitimately wanted to enable retailers to step into the future with a point of sale program, but there's no doubt that it's a, a tried true strategy in other industries to try and lock people into distri distribution through point of sale programs and other types of systems like that. Um, John Jackson Miller. Okay. So you go all the way back to the fifties and the sixties and, and, and the tracking of this stuff. Okay. So were, were there similar, do you know anything about similar efforts in modernization of, say UPC codes on magazines, right? That came at a certain time. Like when did the publishing industry kind of get their act together and try to unify on standards? And is that something even worth thinking about and considering for the for the for the direct market? Well, we get our first UPC codes in the in the seventies, and of course, the, the 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 biggest thing that comics publishers had to do was to with the uh, with UPC codes was they had to figure out a way to get rid of them uh, because they they would not uh, sell uh, they did not want any uh, returnable uh, comics to uh, or any non returnable comics to bleed back into the uh, returnable market. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about this whole time we've been discussing this is that depending on what year it is in the history of comics, we've had feast or famine in terms of the amount of information out there. Uh, and I'm not talking about sales figures right now, but the, the number one thing that both, well, re really fans and archivists and certainly retailers need to have 
which is a list of everything coming out every week. Um, and if you go to the 60s and through the 70s, uh, that's entirely fans coming up with that. Yeah. Uh, that's the comics reader running its own list. That's uh, Amazing Heroes running its list. Uh, comics Buyer's Guide running its, running its list. Although his CBG's list was usually coming from uh, the distributors, we would do, actually, we used Cap City's list. Uh, and, and, and then what we had to do is we had to, we, we get into that period, which is where we're again now. Uh, we got into that period in 1995 through 97, where not every distributor was selling everything. And so we, again, along with Comic Shop News, and every so often, I think somebody would publish on Usenet, uh, you know, the, the, I think that was the that was the that was the beginning of the comic list website yeah. was uh, was on Usenet. Uh, it it would be fans having to collate this information or interested people, uh, you know, collating it. And so, I mean, I, the, this is going to be the challenge going forward. And and I don't just mean for for people like me, the archivist, putting together the price guide in 2030, 2040, 2050. Uh, or the or the sales chart uh, you know, index or whatever, uh, it, you know, it's it's going to be a retail issue. I somebody somebody literally tweeted to uh, or, uh, to me earlier today. Are there new comics tomorrow? Um, I, you can't assume everybody is going to have your app. You can't assume any of that. And so the question is, you know, for for twenty years we didn't really have to f worry with it so much because. Diamond sold just about everything, and it did have a weekly list. Uh, and in fact, you know, Capital had a weekly list, uh, and, and Diamond as well. Uh, Diamond had Diamond Dateline. Capital had new weekly releases. Uh, I consider those to be the gold standard of actually when stuff came out uh, in terms of superseding all other information in the eighties. Uh, that's going to be a thing going forward. Is uh, is uh, once we start uh, you know, breaking up again uh, the distribution level of this, uh, the consumers are not going to know right away where to go to for all of the information uh, about what's coming out. It has been coming from the retailers. There, there are a lot of issues with previews, but remember, one of the reasons that these catalogs came out to begin with, they were to supersede the retailer's newsletter. You had retailers that were doing right. newsletters – uh, you know, mimeograph or whatever else in the in the old days uh, uh, of what's coming out photocopied. Uh, the whole idea was here's something so you can s spend all your time selling, and yes. this lists everything you need to know. Uh, uh, you know so anyway, that, that's I think that's going to be a question going forward. It's pretty amazing. You actually raise like people don't think like what is the value of a distributor? What well, they take this and they put it here, right? but it's that aggregation and the central point of ordering. If a retailer had to order from every single independent publisher out there, how what a nightmare that would be logistically and just how much time it would take. It's really the concentration of these things, the removal of duplication of efforts, like you're saying, of the list generation monthly, weekly, et cetera. And now that's all come to the 21st century and guys like Stu and Brian are, are making it happen. Guys, I, we're gonna get out of here soon. I got I got a jet, but I think we want to. We've still got a couple more segments here. I want to do. I want to throw it up to the viewer comments soon, and then we're going to do some predictions, guys. So I'm going to turn on uh, the ability for you guys to see viewer comments. There's not very many. I'll put a couple up on the screen, and we'll and we'll talk to, about them, and uh, and then be ready to make a prediction. Here's the thing, guys. I'm going to ask you to make a prediction that is specific. And you may, and you cannot predict the one thing you're not allowed to predict because everybody has predicted so far. Comics are going to be okay. We know that. Okay. All right. Comics are going to be all right. What we want to know is make a prediction, something real. Put 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 a prediction on the line, and I'm going to compile these predictions one day, and I'm going to call people. I'm going to do what they never do on these shows, and I'm going to say who is right and who is wrong about their predictions. All right. So starting with our comments, I'm going to go all the way back because there ain't that many guys. Oh man, uh, some nice stuff from oh. Frequent watcher and contributor Brian Garside. Hi there. Oh, long time, uh, Brian. Hey, hello, my fellow Canuck. Hope you're on the channel again soon. He will be. He will be. Say hi, Brian. Hi. Oh, hey, it's Dan Peter Holt. 
Long, uh, he's he's a great regular uh, commenter and contributor. Thanks for for watching, Peter. Appreciate it. Um, oh, let's see. Exploding Printy says my LCS mentioned that Comic Hub was being changed. Current app has stopped the line placement of orders, and I asked, "What happened, Stewie?" Sorry, That's Stewie. Me. That's it. Um, the app, the original app's like five years old, so it was getting tired. And also, now that we've got the ability for people to pay for what's arrived as it arrives in store um through the website and the and the and the, obviously the website login on your phone we wanted to bring that into the app so we've it's currently been completely rebuilt um to be a more you know sexy modern app where people can just turn it on and bang pay for what's there um what they'd expect so yep it's uh, exploding pretty it's on its way back we are we're due i think for middle of july for the android and then about 10 days later for iphone so Ah, you, can, you can still use the customer website now while you're waiting for that. So there was always a, there's always been a website and an app. Um, it's just the app itself that was um, withdrawn. Cool. Thanks, Brittany. Hey, Weird Dad says, in before the comic gators come in to suck all the life out of it. We've been lucky so far, guys. Thanks, thanks, uh, Weird Dad. Oh, man, a friend of mine, a new friend, and, uh, and a, a longtime member and a historian of the direct market, Robert Beerbaum. It says Diamond absorbed Bud Plant in 1988 because all the energy was pulling Bud's gig apart. Bud grew so large because he had to absorb Pacific and alternate realities. The direct market is always a house of cards. No, Grip, any comments on that? Those are your kind of your peers and your and, and your people you're talking about there. Uh, yeah, I would. Uh, hi, Bob. I guess uh, I would uh, <laughs> point out we bought uh, Pacific's part of Illinois location, which was a, a core of our international business, which at the time we sold out was probably 20 or 30 percent of our business. So it didn't all go to bud. Um, but I do think uh, managing growth was one of the key uh, issues during that time. Uh, I learned how to manage, manage hyper growth, but it was not easy. You know, it's extremely challenging. Because uh, you can't rely on, I mean, if you're looking at quarterlies, you're dead, even monthlies, you know, are not that good. You've got to know what's going on all the time. So that's one of the things that drove me toward data and uh, created the fascination that continues today is you got to understand the world around you, especially when it's changing fast. And Mill, you were ahead of your time, man. It's now big data. That's all anybody talks about. And you were, you were into it way back when. Brian Garside, man, he's, he's here, he's there, he's walking, he's listening, he's contributing. But he wants to say every other comic wife said website could take lessons from my season too. It's a nicely laid out website and not overwhelmed with ads. I think that's probably partly because there are paid subscriptions supporting it. But yeah. Milton, it is, it is really nice. Thanks. Uh, the site is built on the idea that retailers are the busiest people in the world. They don't have any extra time. Anything that slows them down, whether it's a pop-up or you know something that's an interstitial, anything that slows that down is not good for their business. So we try to make ICV2 easy and fast to use and controlling the ad load is part of that. Got it. Okay. Uh, Nemesis says, uh, there's like five other streams going on right now. We still got a decent turnout. Right. I, we did. Uh, oh man. Good buddy from San Francisco, Leaf Smith. This was, he was my comic shop guy last time I was living in San Francisco. Leaf says new installs of Comic Suite are now based on a clone of RMS and development does continue. Nothing on the Microsoft platform ever dies, right? Well, that was that was something. Even though I'm I'm not a I'm not a huge uh, tech guy. Although I think my I, I designed my first collection software on PFS file for the Apple II years and years and years ago. Uh, I, I I think one of the things, and this ties into what Milton was saying about retailers not having a lot of time. Uh, a lot of businesses use legacy softwares, legacy programs, legacy systems going back uh, many, many years. As long as they work, they'll 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 keep working. Uh, my son's an electronics engineer uh, student, and he's obsessed with the 6802 microprocessor, oh, yeah. the, Motorola, the Motorola from from the old Apple II. And he's hacked this thing and he's writing programs for it. And I said, why are you doing this? Are you crazy? This is like a Model T. And he has pointed out to me all of the major industries that have these chips oh, in yeah. gargantuan capital, in, you know, big, big, big machines and things like that. And of course, you know, they had people running around trying to, you know, does anybody know COBOL uh, yeah. you know, just a, a few weeks ago? So, uh, I mean, I think, 
and, and this is this is uh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> so so I, I think I think you know particularly when we're talking about a, a comics industry that's got you know two thousand stores. We hope still. Uh, you know it, 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 you know we're, we're always going to have a patchwork. And we're always going to have uh, people that are on different levels of how much time they want to put into it, and the the businesses are going to be different. And then, so I, you know, I'm I'm impressed by what you guys do because you have to come up with a Swiss Army knife. Uh, the, it's got to be something that works for everybody, or or at least enough people that you got critical mass. Well, that's a good point, actually, John, that you brought up. There's trade off with desktop software versus like cloud based right everybody goes the cloud the cloud is great right but what happens if god forbid new zealand an asteroid knocks new zealand out tomorrow what happens to all those i don't know so you know what i mean science, like, fiction, science fiction is my department then <laughs> <laughs> well i'm just saying there are trade offs right but on the other hand Who's more likely to have a data, the data backed up and have disaster recover programs, every comic store in the nation or Stu in his data center, right? You got to think of things. You got to think of those trade-offs, people. Um, okay. Oh, man, we got more. Well, and, and, and that's a yeah. huge thing with Comic Suite is, is I've heard of stores who've literally lost their computer, you know, a flood or whatever, and, and everything is gone. Yes. So, yeah, absolutely. Like, if you do use something like that, please, please, please have offsite backups. And if you don't have offsite backups, like, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> One of my first jobs in the computer industry was I used to go to a giant robot and take tapes out of it and put it in a special box and a truck would come and take those to a <laughs> nuclear <laughs> shelter somewhere, right? So, all right. Uh, long time supporter coffee breath, man. This guy has been watching me since I was doing super crappy uh, X-Men review videos. He says, thanks for the wrench, meaning he's now a moderator on this channel because he's been such a great supporter. He's the one helping keeping the comment section so gentle and, and fun tonight. So thanks, CB. Hey, we should shout uh, out to Leaf. Leaf Smith is Mission Comics, right? Mission Comics in San Francisco. Yeah, that's correct. That's one of, that's one of Stu's uh, shops. They use comic Oh, yeah. He is a comic hub. Uh, 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 Pretty much an OG. Yeah. 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 He was he was there fairly early. Well, uh, Stu's. Yeah. Sorry, Stu. Uh, I think he's been two years with us. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, when he pointed it out to me, when he first showed it to me, I was shopping with him. And I was like, that, that's it, Leaf. That's the future. That's everything that I envisioned and wanted it to be. It's It's like, if I were making a choice now, I would be having a really tough time deciding what to go with. Um, I'm on the fence. I'll tell you the truth, guys. I can't wait for Stu to come and give that demo, and I'm going to pick it apart, dude. Every little uh, just, you do that, so awesome. you do that. So awesome. Um, okay, exploding printy is back. She's a user, Stu. So she says, uh, well, I wish I could cancel a subscription in app. It's easy to place orders, but cancellation has to be done by email or in store. Any plans for that feature? I think we're we're talking with our clients about allowing it pre-FOC or pre-initial order. So there are there are other parts to the system where at the beginning of the catalog cycle, every customer gets an email with everything that the store is going to order for them at the end of the month. And um, I think all of our clients are pretty happy with the idea that the people can cancel before FOC, but just that understanding for the customers that once we've actually, once it's gone firm, then it is firm. So, uh, and as I said, the app's been completely rebuilt so I'm. I think it's going to be coming in. It was something early on that a lot, you know, our, our retail clients were like, "No, we don't want that. We want to be told." Um, the the key is they don't want it to be cancelled silently. That's yeah, the part. Exactly. They don't want. They don't want to have an order in there. You don't want to replace the hundred orders thinking you had ninety five pre ordered and it arrives and you only got sixty. Sure, but absolutely. But we're continually evolving it and improving it and taking the feedback. So I don't. I think that's something that's definitely going to be coming up. Leaf, you know, leaf. I, yeah, yeah, that's one of the one of the things that said our clients say if you get Comic Hub today, it's the it's the worst it'll ever be because there'll be a better version out next week because yeah, we're right. continually upgrading. So yeah, I mean, yeah. that's the other thing about the cloud, right? Is when you got software that like you just wake up the next day and wow, there's a new feature that appeared or yeah. there's a new something that happened. I didn't have to upgrade. I didn't have to back out or get a subscription fee. It just yeah. sort of happened. It keeps getting better. I love that. 
I, I think it's so important that people are working on, you know, new and better ways to do subscription uh, files. I This is something which seems like it's in our DNA now, but uh, it, I, one of the things that I found doing my historical research has been that it was, it, you know, one, of, one of the problems with comics back in the day is that people didn't buy comics the same way they bought other magazines. People would subscribe to TV Guide. Uh, and so TV Guide would have a, a significant portion of its uh, readership already prepaid. Uh, comics, not so much. I mean, it was never more than about 5% by mail, uh, with, the exception of a, with the exception of a few titles like Barbie, when Jerry Calabrese brought his list of a million uh, you know, kids uh, to Marvel. Uh, and and they were doing like forty fifty thousand. They they would you know do uh, subscription ads on SpaghettiO cans and you know, uh, things uh, like that. Uh huh. Things like that. But you know one of the things that I've I've noticed is uh, you know okay, this, this comics are shipping again. Uh, this came to me brand new. Uh, the nineteen sixty one issue of uh, May nineteen sixty one of Sad Sacks Funny Friends showed up today from uh, from uh, Lone Star Comics. Uh, and I was doing the math on it today. It, it, it came out in the middle of February in 61. Uh, I project it had sales of 200,000 copies. Uh, three issues later, it's 260,000. And you would look at that number today and you would say, oh, it's gone to the moon. It's great. Everybody must love Sad Sack. Uh, no, three months after that, or rather three issues after that, it's down to 172. Uh -huh. uh, and what is going on is uh, it was the the seasonal variations were incredible. Uh, the uh, you know, we we uh, we've experienced in the direct market. We used to call uh, in, had a couple of black September's in the eighties uh, where you know the sales just fell off the uh, fell off the uh, continental shelf. Uh, but back in the back in the sixties and seventies, it was just absolutely normal. Uh, that sales would uh, would be uh, you, you just jagged, 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 and if you were to look at these uh, these sales numbers I've got, I have to look at them two or three times because I am accustomed to seeing this nice sort of a smooth thing. And of course, yes, first issues are always way up there, and everything else is down. Uh, but the, the 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 fact that retailers have these subscription uh, uh, folders. Uh, and we have ways of locking in uh, consumers to buying something on a regular yeah, yeah. basis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is self-regulating, uh, and it has made comics uh, mm. a uh. perennial thing instead of instead of what it was. And I think it's I think it's necess a necessary condition for comics to continue as periodicals. Okay, I like that take on it. Hey, King KDI says, considering what's happening all over the world, why are local comics not stores not using P Cloud, which I don't know what that is, or Microsoft Azure? I know what that is. For Comic Core Hub, use Salesforce. They can build you a CRM tailored for your needs. Well, I have to use Salesforce. I'm going to take this one. Salesforce would be the absolute worst choice you can oh make. Oh, my God. For a point of sale system. I develop on Salesforce every single day and for the last 10 years. It's great for a lot of things. I have actually built a comic book point of sale as a test for fun on Salesforce. It's the wrong platform for a point of sale. I'm just going to say it. Um, but there are lots of cloud platforms. Stu, what is your stuff built on, man? What are you, um, AWS? We, That's where I'm going to be building. We're a little bit, we, we use Microsoft Azure. Our, our product is what we call an offline cloud solution. So it actually, the, the main database is housed on the retailer's desktop and it syncs with the cloud when you start up and gets data as it needs to. And as you sell items, it pushes it back and forwards. And we did it that way because the internet crashes, you know, and oh, yeah. we've, we, we've, had a, we've had a situation, I think it was two years ago on Free Comic Book Day, one of our clients, you know, they lost the internet and they rang up all panicked and we're like, don't worry about it, just turn the computer on, it's not, it's not going to bother. So they actually didn't actually understand the architecture, which was okay. Um, but yeah, we, all of our, all of our data is stored uh, on Azure and, um, oh, sorry, and we um, interact, into, yeah, interact back and forth. That's beautiful, yeah. man. That I didn't realize that you had a local sync database as well. Yeah. That was always part of my plans, and I could never figure out the way to make that work exactly right, too. So kudos for that. Great stuff. Um, Brian Garside says, says, 
Comic stores don't want to manage their own software. It's so expensive to build. Like, what the heck, man? It is. Been down that road. Even if you are, like I was, a programmer, there's an opportunity cost to your time. Like, my software was free. I didn't pay anything for it except for the thousands of hours that I spent working on it that I could have been working yeah. on selling more comics instead of writing software. Luckily for me, I realized that software was really what I liked more than retailing. So it worked out right for me. Um, guys, that's about it for comments. I want to go now to predictions. We're going to go around the horn. I'm going to say goodbye to you after you do your predictions. Uh, I'm going to start with, uh, let's start with, ooh, he tells the past. Now tell us the future, John Jackson Miller. What's going to happen? Oh, we'll see. That's 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 uh, that's not a good question. Uh, <laughs> the uh, when uh, we were talking about uh, talking about uh, college experiences earlier, uh, my my I have a master's degree in Soviet studies. The reason I have a master's and not a doctorate is that this the Soviet Union collapsed on my dissertation, uh, and. <laughs> uh, I, Everything I was studying vanished, and I, I was encouraged to continue along with it. And I said, I'm sorry, this is not something which is subject to academic study right now. This is in the realm of the journalists uh, to say what's going on. And if I'm going to be a journalist, I'm going to write about something fun. And so I ended up going to comics, although I went to lumber first. Uh, but but that's that's where I went. And, okay. and of course, I... I I ended up very quickly ending up with the the distributor wars and getting to cover uh, the breakup of of a, of a system and 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 everything like that. Um, okay. Currently, so I currently I don't think that you can predict just about anything. I think tough. that I I th I think I think that uh, the United States economy needed a lot more money pumped into it. And a lot more capital pumped into it than we actually got, uh, and we have, uh, you know, we talk about two thousand stores. We have two thousand different economies, uh, micro economies. Every store is in a different situation. Uh, whatever we say about UCS or Lunar or DC or anybody else, I've talked to many different retailers, all of whom have the, every horse is riding in its own direction. Mm -hmm. And is doing whatever they can do, and I don't think that you can actually. Uh, uh, yeah, I I may not do any year to year comparisons. Uh, you know, just on the regular monthly charts until I see that there are monthly charts, and yeah. until I see what, and, and until I see what, how that's going to be denominated, and and so it's a, uh, 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 this is a this is kind of a game of fifty two card pickup at the moment, and. Uh, It'll be more interesting to study three years from now than it will be to actually live in it, I think. Okay. That was a cop out, but I'm going to let you go with it, John, because, <laughs> because uh, frankly, it's like I, I couldn't predict what's going to happen next no, week. This is, Honestly, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is like, has to uh, know when to pull the chips back from the table. <laughs> okay. Well, John, th thank you for coming in. Uh, stick around. We're going to chat at the end if you've got time. Uh, but uh, we're hopefully you're going to come back soon with some sales analysis. We do. We try to do a quarterly thing with John. John Jackson Miller, thanks again for, for being on the show. Okay, let's go to Brian Garside. Brian, um, what can you predict, man? Be, be, be specific. Well, uh, let's start off with this two shall pass because I think that's that's important, right? Like this is just a, a blip and it's it's a blip that's happening through something that has nothing to do with the actual comics industry. This isn't like the collapse in, in the 90s. This is something totally different. Um, but I think what's going to come out of this is stronger retailers. The retailers that remain will be stronger. There's a massive push for the first time that I can remember, and Stu will attest to this too, in retailers actually are coming to us and saying, we need technology. I've been pushing technology on retailers for 15 years, and none of them wanted it. Now, suddenly we've got this avalanche of them coming saying, we need it. Um, and Stu, you'll, you'll probably, you're probably you probably seeing the same thing, that retailers want to get off of RMS for the first time in ages. All of a sudden, I've got, like, I've literally had six demos so far this week, and we're, what, Tuesday? Even though I say every day is Monday now. Like, that's, it's insane. So there's an, an urge 
to change. They understand that technology is what they need to do. Having been offline for two months there has suddenly meant that they absolutely know that they have to, to adapt to the situation. And there's a willingness for the first time ever for retail to adapt. So I think we're going to have a stronger retail at the end of this. And we're going to have a much more flexible uh, group of retailers. Not all of the retailers are going to survive, but the ones that do are going to be awesome. So yeah, right. I think it's going to be better. I like that, Brian. And 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 while sure, probably COVID had something, the crisis had something to do with people going to you for demos, but don't underestimate the effect of appearing on comic book news. Comic book news, news, Brian. So thanks, Brian. Stick around and, and we'll chat at the end if you got time. Thanks. Thanks for being sure on do. the show. Stu. Uh, yeah. Stu Colton. So tell me, give me a prediction. Uh, What's um, going to happen? I... Uh, man, um, I, I think whatever DC has done, whatever their reasons for doing it are purely financial, right? I don't believe anything about strengthening or whatever. I think it's it's basically 100% for their bottom line. And I don't see how other publishers won't be looking at that bottom line and doing the same thing. That's, I think there's going to be more publishers using Luna and UCS. Ah, I, I had actually have heard from one publisher only that they reached out and uh, to either Lunar, I think it was Lunar, and they and Lunar said, "Now we just distribute DC." Right. Or whoever. Yeah. So I was surprised. I mean that, that that I mean that may be a case of right now. That's all they can do. Right. But I think once they've got everything sorted, once every, all their struct file structures and the and the flow is working, I if it's if it's cheaper for a publisher to use them, I yeah, I, why would anyone it's, or Diamond improve their terms to, right. um, well, to combat well, that? Think, but right. Competition's good, I, right? That's what I mean. It's a good thing. I, I, yeah. Like I had no problem with DC going to other distributors. I think that was good. But it's the removing the choice of diamond as well that makes it a just a, a bad move. That to me was the the crux the, of it. The only the only part of it that was a bad move to me was the timing. Yeah, and uh, the timing. I, I mean, there's 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 some retailers and and some of our clients. I mean, they're they're, they're, they're I'm concerned for their their mental health with what's mm -hmm. going on with you know protests and COVID and some of them having their doors kicked in and then turning around and turning your computer on and. So you've just been kicked in the nuts as well as having your door kicked in, isn't it? Um, I think that was the worst part of it. I, I, the change, fine, but the the suddenness of it, dropping it on a Friday and walking away, I I I, I think that was pretty crappy. Yeah, I agree, Stu. Thanks. S stick around, Stu, and we'll talk, man. Thank yeah. you for being on the show. Yeah. We'll have you back soon for that full demo. I cool. promise you. Okay. Okay. All right, Milton. You brought us. We we started with you. We're going to end with you, man. You talked about the past we talked about the present and where we think the future can go give us a prediction please well um i've been in this business a long time early 70s and i've seen a lot of transformational moments and this is definitely one of them um so the first part of the prediction is that the business is going to be radically different a year or two from now than it is right now and to me the biggest thing that's going to change is the concept of a retailer uh, in the past the last 20 years at least there's been two kinds of retailers there's been a retailer that uh, ran a website or a retailer that had a brick and mortar store where you went in to buy stuff. And to me, uh, it seems like the concept of a retailer is moving toward a place of community. And that community may exist in a physical location or maybe have events that pop up and aren't there permanently. Uh, and a lot of it is sustained online. And a fair amount of the commerce also is going to take place online. And uh, retailers that don't adapt to that kind of environment are not going to be able to make it through the next two years or however long it takes to get COVID under control. And um, so there will be a winnowing of the retailers that don't adapt and an opportunity for growth for the retailers that do. Well, have you seen the guys doing, man, we had him on the show, Jesse James. He's got a 24 hour comic book uh like qvc uh he's got 12 retailers that do a two-hour show all day every day they're selling comics on facebook directly to people have you heard of this stuff yeah i think we did a story on that it's amazing facebook, i really i'm gonna facebook have to live, right? facebook live 
Yeah, on Facebook Live. Yeah, and he's got a really interesting system. It's like a whole new model I'd never heard of or considered. It's it's fascinating to me. And we're going, everybody's scrambling. The crisis really is bringing out the creativity in all segments. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, it accelerates the change. And um, we've got so many, you know, we've got compound issues right now with uh, COVID changing how people are interacting in public and a, a financial crisis behind it. So a lot of things driving change right now. <laughs> That's right, Milton. Well, thank you for coming in. Thank you for um, sharing your wisdom with us. And we hope you'll come back again for a panel sometime. Thank you, Dan. And thanks to all our readers and supporters. We really appreciate you. All right. All right. Thanks. Stick around, Milton. We'll talk. I'm, I'm going to wrap this thing up and then I'll, I'll join you guys in the green room. All right. Uh, or is this the green room? It's fairly green. Um, guys, so, all right. It's time. It's all over. This is it. I'm going to wrap it up. Last time I got a little emotional. Stu really nailed it, man, when he said that we're getting kicked in the nuts right now from all from, from from everywhere, right? I really let I lost my cool on the last show, and that is not cool. And uh, I've been losing my cool in a lot of places lately, on not just on YouTube, but in life, man. We, there, there's so many things, so many crazy, stressful things happening. I can't imagine if I was still a comic book retailer and had to be in that store and had to figure out how in the heck I'm going to make a living when my whole thing was that I'm a place you can come to and hang out and be as opposed to buying online. And now you can't even do that. The challenges that are out there for retailers are, um, they're daunting, right? But I have confidence because anybody who stayed a retailer long enough to still be one today has got the skills to pivot, to change when the market changes. We saw different distributors, we saw different companies. We see these things come and go. I honestly feel like now that Marvel and DC are so corporate that we're going to have to see the rise of other things in comics. That's where we're seeing Kickstarter and we're seeing people going completely outside of the realm of publishers altogether. The barriers to entry to produce great comics and put them out to a huge amount of people have never been lower. And so um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight and uh, for watching the show and supporting it. Didn't get any super chats tonight. Oh, man. What am I going to do? I don't know. I guess I'll have to work for a living. That's what I do. So I'm going to come back next week with another new show. And, man, I've got somebody. He's just a legend. I I, I say legend sometimes, and, and maybe I drop that word too much. But Ron Turner of Last Gasp Comics is nothing but a legend. Last Gasp is one of the most important comics publishers of all time, full stop not underground publishers, just one of the great publishers of all time. They publish some of the most important and best comics ever. If you haven't read Slow Death or Anarchy Comics or any of the wonderful titles that they produced or just distributed because Ron and, and Last Gas were a publisher and a distributor and they just put out material you just could not find anywhere else. Stuff you sure weren't going to find at Diamond. I used to go to Last Gasp and go through their offices and through their warehouse and literally crawl up and find old copies of underground comics that were just sitting around still for sale. It was amazing. I'm going to talk to Ron about all that stuff. Um, thanks everybody for watching. Thanks for the support. Again, I'm really sorry about the whole super chat fiasco last time. I know certain people went on. There is out there, you can search and there is a six hour live stream. Okay. By a certain person that goes out there and he took my video and they broke it down for six hours and thousands of people watched it far more than watched my live stream, watched this live stream and made fun of me and called me a beta soy cuckold and whatever they wanted to call me for six hours. And I thought it was hilarious guys. And here's why you guys know nothing about me. So when I come on here and I talk, and you say, this guy's a social justice warrior. All of my friends and all the people who really know me go, that is ridiculous. Dan is the guy, I'm the guy that gets accused of being alt-right adjacent or something because I'm willing to talk to some of you comics uh, gate people. So those of you that went nuts and want to go crazy, I don't want to talk to you. But those of you who that are comic gate people and want to have civil conversation, you're welcome here on the show to make comments super chats or non super chats or whatever. If you got something interesting to say, I'm going to listen to it. But if all you got is garbage and hate, well, I got no time for that. I got enough of that in my life already. So anyway, thank you all for watching. I really appreciate it. 
we're going to see you soon. When is that going to be? I don't know. I guess it's going to be next time. See ya.